just to remind you, we've uh, looked at different uh, contexts for our uh, look at racial questions, and we've gone through the home and family and um, politics, and then uh, the last session, the institutions, and now uh, basically a public sphere, the media, and popular culture. And I turn it back over to Richard Louis. Thank you, Charlie. What a great panel we've got today to talk about uh, media and popular culture. Uh, Donna Bird, publisher of The Root, thank you for being here today. We have Mona Eltahawi from uh, uh, A Columnist, thank you so much for being here. Will Griffin, thank you, President and CEO of Hip Hop On Demand, uh, as well as this guy, and you guys don't know who this guy on the left side is, Spike Lee, founder of uh, 40 Acres and Mule Filmworks. Uh, everybody knows him as well. So what a great panel to talk about this subject today. And as you know, the entire subject that we're looking at today is the state of race in America. So I'd like to start by asking you what the state of race uh, in media is. Uh, if you could give me your thoughts about where we're at, and Spike, uh, by the way, well, half these pointed because I forgot to mention. He's going to have to leave at four. He uh, has to, a plane to catch. He's headed up to uh, New York. And th there's, a, there's a reason for this. And I'll let you explain what you have to be there for. Well, I have to be there for my man. Tonight, Chris Rock is making his debut on Broadway. The name of the play is called The Motherfucker with the Hat. <laughs> 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 Swear to God. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to, so please excuse me. Leaving early, and I thought I would be on an earlier panel, but I have to leave. So please excuse me. Thank you. I wanted him to announce uh, the name of that, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write the plan. I'm just like, Spike, going. you're doing that. <laughs> I'm going to sit over on my side of the. Okay, why don't you start then for us? How about that? What, your your feelings again about the the state of race in media? Be honest. It seems like we've been having panels like this forever. Mm -hmm. When we're discussing. The same thing over and over, O-V-A-H, over and again, you know, and what is really, I mean, we have, I mean, what Open Winfrey's done is magnificent, but if you look at the, I'm really talking about Hollywood and network and right. uh, cable television, you know, the, it's kind of... Are we in a better place, you think, or...? Than what? <laughs> than before, because you said we've been talking about this over and over and over again. Look at look what's on television. I, I mean, and... Is there a Cosby show now? No. And I think that this reality show it's going to bring about the downfall of Western civilization, or, you know, and <laughs> these reality shows are unbelievable to me, but I just think that, and it's something I said before, we could do a lot of stuff independently, but we're talking about the institutions, Hollywood, and television, you break that down into network and broadcast. Unless we become the gatekeepers is not going to change. The gatekeepers are the people who a very select few, again, in Hollywood and in television, radio, in, in television, it's a broadcast network. These select few decide what's going on and what's not going on. And there is not one person of color that I know of that is a gatekeeper, and what I just said, and you, and you cannot use, oh, forget about Ms. Winfrey, but you cannot use Will Smith and Denzel, because even when Will Smith wants to do a film, and most of the films are done at Sony, he still has to call Amy Pascal and say, I want to do this film. Now, of course, with him being the biggest star in Hollywood, if he wants to do the phone book, they're gonna say yes, but he still has to go to any one of the studio heads and said, this is what I want to do. We're not in the room. Quick analogy. When the masterminds at an unnamed studio, at an unnamed studio decided that they want to do a film called Soul Plane, there was no one in the room who said, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
can we just talk about this? Uh, African American Airline, they go plate, rims that spin on the plane, hydraulic wheels, Snoops the captain, <laughs> cheebing up. <laughs> we got a pole in the back, and we serve fried chicken and malt liquor. No one in the room to say, WTF, wait a minute. <laughs> this is not a good idea. <laughs> We're not in those decision making. These studios, every quarter, they sit around a room and people have green light votes. And they look at the budget, they look at the script, they look at how much money they think they can make overseas, and they vote on what films they're gonna make and what films they're not gonna make. And we're not in those positions yet. How do you get there? Well, the thing about film is that there's like, there's no one way to do anything. I mean, you could be a, a hostess at a restaurant and the working at a, being head of a studio. So it's not like you do this, 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 this. There's right. connections, there's this and that. And uh, I think that number one, we have to delegate. I think the time has to come where African American artists can be making art and also raising the film too. We have enough African Americans or Hispanics who are coming out of business, who's coming out of Stanford, who've come out of Howard, who's coming out of Stern Business School at NYU, who's coming out of Wharton School at Penn, that they, I mean, that's not my metier. I don't know how to do all that business stuff. I just, you know, try to do art. Mm -hmm. And ask the, the artist to also raise the money and come up with a business plan I, mean, I cannot tell, I, if someone came to me and said, Spike, I want you to give me a business plan for X amount of dollars for a slate of films. I can't do that. You know? And I just think that we have to get people, that's what they want, your job is to do this, forget, lead, lead the art to the artists, and just get together. All right, great way to kick it off. Uh, Will, what would you say? I think, I, I think, A, Hollywood's in trouble, right? And so this is kind of like we just had this discussion, you know, when the somebody catches a cold, we catch pneumonia type of thing. So Hollywood's in trouble, and then the black artists within Hollywood are caught up, just trying to fit into what that system is. And you know, we've talked, you know, quite a bit about this. I mean, they have to deal with technology, they have to deal with changes, they have to deal with competition for the consumer. Bootlegging. It's bootlegging. So what they focused on now, there's the tentpole film. So now it's basically formulaic about what happens to the suit at the studio. Now there is an example, and we didn't we didn't talk about this, of somebody who when you're a black filmmaker, they expect you to be the artist and the entrepreneur at the same time, right? So, you know, you're going to be on the camera, you're going to direct the movie, you're going to executive produce the movie, and you're going to raise the money. That's how you get green light, which really, in the real world, that, that's, that's almost Superman, right? When you did She's Gotta Have It, or, or even Woody Allen before that, they're like, these are amazing filmmakers because they can raise the money. All, they, they'll bring us a film ready to go. All we have to do is put it in theaters. And that is kind of the expectation of African-American filmmakers today. It's just t too big. Uh, back to the point about there's no Cosby show today. You know, I, I did, we did a show called Run's House, which was essentially like, you know, a, re a reality Cosby show. You know, at least as far as we looked at it. Love that show. Uh, thank you. Well, there are only a couple of places who are going to buy it. ABC Family would have bought it, and then MTV, you know, ultimately bought it, which is where we were. And there's not like a huge market for it. The WB didn't want it at the time. WB didn't want it. UPN didn't want it. ABC, NBC, they weren't trying to do it. And I think the biggest uh, uh, issue is there are no standards now uh, for the content, and especially as it relates to African American content. 
And one of the things, at least I've proposed in some of the media companies that I've been talking to, is like we need the, uh, an Apollo project for African American media, which is a total rethink, which is to say, 10 years from now, which is what President Kennedy looked out 10 years from now, we're going to be on the moon and we're going to reach these points and moved all the resources, the best thinking towards having that goal. And I think if we thought 10 years from now or 20 years from now, when we look back and we said first African-American president, a real life Cosby show in the White House, right? You know, I mean, even it, it, reality has outstripped imagination of the possibilities. And I think a uh, rethink of the media industry would say, how do we make, how do we extend our imaginations beyond, you know, the reality of what's going on in our society? And if people look back 20 years from now and they looked at this day, to this day, what would we want to say we were about? What did we record on television? What did we put out on film? How did we represent ourselves in our times? You know, and you know, even like when you look at news, where is the new Ed Bradley? Right? He left a couple of years ago. We lost something. You know, and I just think about these investigative journal journalism shows. I remember the ABC and the Food Lion thing. And I look at cases like Tea Party. Remember the ABC Food Lion case where ABC undercover reporters, they go in the food line and, and then they realize that the meat was bad, the way it was prepared was horrible. They just drop it on the floor, rinse it off. It was insecticides, et cetera, on it. And I look at today's society and I look at the Tea Party and the way it's covered. People cover it, just the news covers it play by play. Amen. And I'm like, who is going to go out there and tell us the meat is bad? Right, that, the, the Ed Bradley who, who's going to do that for our culture uh, and go out there and cover it. And I think at the end of the day, to ask somebody to go raise money and say, do the job that the fourth estate is supposed to do. No, the fourth estate is supposed to do it. That's the responsibility of the news media. That's your obligation to the electorate. And I feel the same way about Hollywood or television. You have a responsibility to the civilization to produce things that will uplift the civilization that, that match uh, the values in the society overall. And I think we, we have to demand that. And I think it's good business. The first studio that stands up and says, you know what? I'm not gonna be in the just like the last five movies business. I'm putting half a billion dollars over 10 years or a billion over five, if you want to get crazy aggressive and say million, we yeah, don't need a billion. <laughs> bi well, you got to bring me along because Spike already said he can't handle the money, so <laughs> <laughs> he, he, can, he can make. The you know, buying films I can make for a billion. Come on. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you say a billion dollars, and you say we are going to be committed to films for this audience and this market, and we are going to make them work. It would capture the imagination of the community and I think would be very successful in the market. Real quick, I, I just want to say, can I just say this real quickly? Yeah. The thing that we're, not, that we're forgetting is that the United States Census Bureau has said yes. by the year 2035, and some states it might be quicker, white Americans are going to be minority in this country. Yeah. So if just forget about Hollywood and television. Any business yes. in this country does, that does not take that into account starting today or last month and wait to 2035 is going to be extinct. This country is becoming brown. And if you continue to make, if you continue to operate with Leave it to Beaver and Ozzy and Harriet, it's not going to work. 2035 white Americans are going to be, and I'm going to make this up, this United States Census Bureau, white Americans are going to be minority in this country. So that's, that's reflect not just dealing with media, not just how you portray the media, but also the decision makers. You just can't have, you got to give the people who make up the majority of this country, give them jobs and, and, and meaningful positions too. And a part of that fabric you bring up there, Spike, and to you, Mona, here, of course, Muslim Americans. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm really glad that Spike and Will touched on both um, entertainment and news, because when it comes to both, and when it comes to the many hats, to riff off the hats that, or the hat that Spike was talking about earlier. His hat was a little different. It, very different. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, for people like me who wear many hats, where I'm a Muslim, where I'm of Arab descent, where I'm here in the US, 
when it comes to the news media, I mean, it's incredibly lazy. First of all, to, you, if, as a white American, you can talk about everything. You are an expert on everything. And I, I'm, I'm fresh off talking about the Egyptian revolution on various media outlets. But I was asked to talk about the Egyptian revolution because I was born in Egypt. Do they ask me to talk about the Libyan revolution or the Syrian revolution, even though I'm an expert in both those countries and I've actually been mm -hmm. to those countries? No. They go to these white academics who told you all along none of this was ever going to happen. Right. And as it was happening, <laughs> as it was happening, they kept telling you it's not going to work out. And it worked out. And they continue to tell you, no, no, these Arabs are passive. These Arabs love dictators. And I was in there going, hello, can I talk? And no one wants to listen because, again, they keep going to these white experts. So it's incredibly frustrating on that level. And then when it comes to my Muslim hat, I mean, where do I start? First of all, Muslims were not invented on 9-11. Mm. But everybody acts like we were invented on 9-11. The Muslim experience in this country goes back centuries. When they want to talk to someone who's Muslim, first of all, they never talk to a black Muslim in this country. Because they always talk to Muslims like me because they want the foreign Muslim experience. My citizenship exam is tomorrow, so I will hopefully soon become an American. How about that? they see this show? All right, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I'm trying to You should have waited a day or something. <laughs> You should have waited. <laughs> I've been bashing the US administration for years. Don't worry, Spike. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a day before your trouble. <laughs> No, but, but you know, they come to me and they speak to a whole bunch of other Muslims of foreign descent because it's very easy to make that connection. Look at a show like Aliens in America that was a comedy about the Muslim experience in the US. It was this boy from Pakistan with a very noticeable Pakistani accent. Why couldn't they make a show about Muslim Americans who've been in this country for centuries, right. you know? I am relieved that the first con Muslim congressman in this country was Representative Keith Ellison. He's at Excuse me, he's African American, his country, his family has been in this country for centuries. You cannot point to him and say he's a foreigner. But th this is the Muslim experience on, on media. And then when they do go to the foreign Muslim, it's always the Imam. The Imam doesn't represent me. They go to the most conservative example of the Muslim experience because they think conservative equals authentic. And I, again, I'm sitting there going, hello, can you talk to me? Less than 20% of Muslims in this country go to mosque. Less than 20% of Muslims in this country identify with this conservatism that you see on TV, and yet they continue to go to the imam or the very conservative man or a woman in a headscarf. So, you know, on every count I lose when it's to talk about international news issues, I lose because the white academic, the white analyst is always knows more than I do. When it comes to my Muslim experience and the Muslim experience of, you know, you tell people that there, there's documentation that there were Muslim tradesmen in this country with Native Americans centuries ago. You tell them that Islam came across slave ships from West Africa. People's mind boggle. They go, what? But all they want to know is that 9-11, Islam, what does that mean? Because it's very comfortable to keep Islam as the foreign element in this country. It's 10 years after 9-11. Have we learned nothing about the Muslim experience in this country? So I think that when it comes to news media, when it comes to entertainment media, they're incredibly lazy, they're incredibly white-centric, and they don't want to, like Spike says, we've been talking about this forever and ever, and we will continue to talk about this forever and ever. As long as my voice is not considered a, a, an authority, and only an authority on my own, you know, why aren't I being interviewed about the budget cuts? Why aren't I, why aren't I being interviewed about Planned Parenthood? I'm a feminist. I have very strong opinions about Planned Parenthood, but they don't come to me. So th this is my, my problem with media. I think that unless we push it and unless we point out its laziness, it will not change and it will continue to speak above my head, and regardless of whether I'm an American citizen or not. We were great. It was fantastic to have you on MSNBC, I must say, throughout the last couple of months. So, <laughs> you did a great job. So, fantastic on it. We'll see more of you based on what you just said. No tell doubt. them, Richard, you tell them. I'm going to take it home, is what I'm going to do. <laughs> Donna. Uh, I have to agree with all the panelists thus far. I will say this I mean, if you look at the statistics and you look at broadcast media, television and broadcast media, of the 815 executive producers that um, are in broadcast media, 64 of them are African American. 24 uh, out of them, how many? Out of 815. Wow. 64 are African American, 24 are Hispanic, 13 are Asian, one is Native American. When you look at, when you, uh, ASNI just did a survey and they what were field, looking. What field is that? And what? What's that? That's television broadcast. Television? And, yeah, ex executive producers. When you look at print, um, ASNI just did a survey, and they had about 900 uh, papers across the country answer the survey. 50% of those had zero minorities in any management role um, in, their, in their companies. 
And when you look at that, I mean, we have an issue, I think everyone has noted it already, it's a representation. When you don't have anyone in the room to bring up different viewpoints, different ways of looking at a story, stories that may not be uncovered, then you're gonna, you're gonna miss this. And then if you have, many times behind, in the behind the scenes, you have someone who's producing a show and they're asking, who do you know, <coughs> right? They're looking for panelists, they're looking for experts to come on a show, and they may not know that Mona has expertise in a specific area. They know, may think that, oh, she's Egyptian and we can put her on for this, but they may not know the breadth of what she can represent. And the problem is, is that there are not people in the rooms, they're, they're not, uh, sorry, there's not representation in the rooms that can say, I know so, uh, someone who can fill this role and that role and this, um, and this <coughs> sort of uh, group of individuals looks diverse. Um, that also has to do with the stories that are actually told too, mm -hmm. right? So once you have the representation in the room, it has a, a significant influence on the actual content that's, um, that's shown on air. Um, I work for The Root, and um, we are an online publication that is written, most of our writers are African American. We're writing about um, news and politics and culture through an African American lens. Um, and it's interesting how many people come to our site that are hungry for the stories that are not being covered in the mass media. That's what we get day in and day out. And we, interestingly enough, we also get many white um, or non-minority people that are coming into the site that are looking at um, looking for the same thing. They're kind of like, oh, when a story hits that's big on the news, occasionally we have people that are come into the site because they just want to hear what the black perspective is. So we have to sort of move past where, you know, where we have been. We've been talking about this story for years and years and years. And we have to begin to, to affect change. You know, one of the things, I'm, I'm, a, I'm on the business side of, of this industry. And when I look at it, you know, it, unfortunately, when we look at, um, at, at some, of, some of what's going on in media today, it has a business implication, right? So when you look at, I'm gonna move very quickly to your Glenn Becks of the world, your Rush Limbaugh's of the world, those individuals. Donald Trump. D <coughs> the the, the uh, list is expansive. And, um, <laughs> well, let's put them on the list though. <laughs> but when you look at this, you find that unfortunately racism sells, right? So when you have people that are race baiting, racism, however you wanna frame this up, at the end of the day, there, it actually does have, um, it does sell. And it, it's going to take us standing up and saying this is wrong, standing up to the advertisers that are placing advertisement mm -hmm. on these stations and saying we are not gonna stand for this, we're not gonna watch your programming, and we're going to be very vocal about what's going on in your program because it's, because it's toxic, not only to the individuals to, that are watching this, but more broadly to our entire community. I want to launch off what you're saying as well as what uh, the other panelists have. Uh, and back to you, Spike. The idea of an Apollo project uh, that Will brought up earlier and then weaving in what was also mentioned, what might that look like from, from your mind? I don't think it should just be one. I just think that there should be many. It's all about the money. And again, we've had the discussion again and again and again. And it always comes down to money and now there are enough African Americans, there are enough people of color who, who have the capital to do it. Because there comes a point where you gotta, you know, Malcolm always talked about, you know, self-reliance, self-determination, and that looks, I mean, we, could, we, gotta, we gotta have a, a multi-faceted program, so we should have our Apollo projects, we do independent stuff, but that doesn't mean we should let Hollywood and TV get off too. We gotta work in all those different levels. And speaking of Hollywood, and you're talking about the Muslims, Hollywood is very, and you say in a little lesser degree, TV, a little bit, you always gotta have the bad guy. So who was the first great so-called film, D.W. Griffin's Birth of a Nation, who was the bad guy? The black, the slaves after in the re re Reconstruction. And then you go to the Western, who was the bad guy? The Sabbath, you look, that's why I don't think, that's why I don't put John Ford and my pants and the great directors. 
because all the hateful image he did of Native Americans along with his great co-star John Wayne, they tried to fix it up to the last film, I forgot the name of it. But uh, so then, and then World War II broke out, it's the Nazis. So we kicked the Nazis' ass, who's next? The Russians. Soviet Union blows up, so we need a bad guy. 9-11 happens, boom. Right. So every, you look at every film that's come out since 9-11, it's, it's not the Russians anymore, it's the terrorists. And, they, and it's like Muslim equ equals terrorists. Every, you look at all these Hollywood films, it's all, it comes down that the, the new book, the new boogeyman is, is the Muslim. This reflects our culture, doesn't it? What you've just described over time? No, it doesn't reflect our culture. The, the, the people, American people, are being fed this stuff. They're being fed this stuff. I was thinking about, like, when France want to come in, these idiots say, well, no longer French fries or French toast. <laughs> Liberty fries. Freedom fries. No, freedom fries, <laughs> freedom toast, and porn. Dom Perignon into a toilet. They're crazy. <laughs> I mean, we're gullible as a people. And if you tell the lie loud enough and long enough, people can believe. And that's this whole Donald Trump thing is, with this Bertha thing. You know, he's going to keep pounding on it and pounding on it, pounding on it, till. You have half the country believing if there's not that point now that that the president was not born American citizen. Why does he poll well? Why what? Why does Trump poll well? What well, that issue? It, it, just on that issue alone. I mean, I think to this point, that is, the Bertha issue is the fault of the media. Period. Now the media is reporting Trump as though he's a legitimate, you know, to your question, like he's a legitimate candidate. No, he can't be a legitimate candidate on an illegitimate issue. This should have been debunked a long time ago. Can you see Walter Cronkite reading the news, repeating this Bertha nonsense? No. There, there are no standards in, in news media now, so it's all play by play. That's what news does. They report play by play. Now in this poll, Trump's second. Right? It, it's just too much play by play. So some, and I think this is where the opportunity is, and I, I, and I agree with Spike's point. And I, he, you did a film with Ruben McCann to get on the bus, right? Privately funded. And I, I worked on one with him called One With Our Lose, privately funded. We can't privately fund the, the, the solution to this problem. That's, that's part of it. Like he's saying, the Apollo Project has to be at the studio. A media company needs to cut the check. You know, this is a problem that you can throw money at. It's not cultural dependency. It's not generational poverty. This is, we don't have the money to tell the stories. And you can throw money at it and make a difference. Um, but in the news, they're, they're just on these standards. And I think if there's an enterprising uh, within the media companies, if African Americans stand up and say, hey, I'm going to be the standard bearer you know, for my culture, and I'm not going to report the news the way they did. I mean, one guy who's not on the air now on the progressive side was Keith Olbermann. You don't have that voice on television now. And I think there's an opportunity, it would be an opportunity for an African American to stand up. If there were African American or even Muslim, uh, James O'Keefe's, you know, the, the right winger who caught Planned Parenthood, uh, ACORN, you know, he's single-handedly single dismantling progressive organizations with a $600 camera uh, and some access. And I think there's the same opportunity. You tell me you can't go to 10 Tea Party Express stops and get enough footage to make the case that this is a racist organization? You think that there isn't a time among those 100,000 people that they say, I don't care whether the Bertha thing is true or not. You don't think you can capture that on tape? Like, they don't care whether it's true or not. And I think the news media on the Bertha issue should say, that's a dead issue. Anyone who brings it up is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. yep. If you if you get a phone call and they say, hey, do you support Donald Trump? Your answer should be like, no, he's an idiot. He's trying to sell me something. He's trying to hustle my he's trying to hustle me out of my boat with the dead issue. No, I don't support him. Somebody in the media should be saying that, that as a journalist with a responsibility to our republic, I can't come out here and peddle this. You know, who, one person who has been saying it, and ironically enough, it's a comedian, is Jon Stewart. And yes. that speaks to the state of just how miserably news media have failed. This word objectivity is a dead word now. We think that it means something, and it really doesn't mean anything. Because 
the way that it, it's basically been so bastardized that you can have someone like Donald Trump speak this nonsense, or someone like Pamela Geller last year with this issue of Park 51, the Islamic right. Community Center right. and mosque close to Ground Zero. Yeah. I mean, it took John Stewart to say it's not on Ground Zero, you know, and. It was, it was a non-issue until people started campaigning for the elections. It was an, Pamela Geller was a nobody who had a lunatic blog that no one read. <laughs> and you know, no one took this woman seriously. And then they lifted her out of nowhere. And she's been placed on news shows opposite you know, serious people to spout this rubbish about the Islamization of the United States. I mean, what, what, again, like Will was saying, if someone had just stepped in and said, you speak nonsense. This right. is ridiculous. Yes. She would have just been deflated. Instead, she was inflated into this expert of some kind. She's an expert on hate. That's all she's an expert on. And she's put on consistently one after the other of news shows. You had Daisy Khan, who spoke at an earlier panel this morning. She was on, I think she was here this morning. She was speaking on Fox News about a year and a half ago, talking about this Islamic Community Center. And Fox News itself said, oh, this is a great idea. And then Pamela Geller spins this idea into this, the Sharia mosque and blood dripping, and I don't know what, the Muslims are coming you know, to take over and have babies and, and attack us from this community center. And it was taken seriously. So what happened between you know, when Fox News had Daisy on and said it was a great idea, to six or seven months later, to last summer. And America always goes crazy during the summer because you guys don't have anything to think about. So it's either sharks, it's either sharks attacking everybody or forest fires everywhere. So last summer, it was Muslims everywhere. <coughs> last summer, it became about Park 51. And this Pamela Geller lunatic, you know, became this, this huge megastar. I do not understand. And then she invites people over like Geert Wilders from the Netherlands, another hate monger. And so she has this kind of congregation of hate in New York, whereas in the beginning, if it had just been nipped in the bud and she would have been told, you are just talking hate and no one is going to invite, you know, she's free to talk hate. I'm not saying censor her. Have her talk hate on her blog, but to turn her into an expert and to, to the fact that I, you know, I was outside Park 51 last summer doing sidewalk activism with a group of activists who were outside this community center for three weeks, basically telling Americans what they should know. And what I'm learning for my citizenship exam, which is the First Amendment guarantees you the right of freedom of worship and freedom of expression. So I'm sitting there outside Park 51 and all these Americans who are watching Fox News and watching Pamela Geller come to this community center and yell obscenities at us. Someone actually left a, a bag of dog poop outside this community center. And then another nutcase, this televangelist comes outside, complete with a news crew to tell us about how he's there to save Muslim women because we need saving. And outside this community center is six Muslim women standing behind him, you know, shouting out peace, love, and tolerance, going, we do not need to be saved. So it's, it's <laughs> got to this ludicrous situation where this right-wing televangelist claims to be speaking on my behalf. What about the guy who's burning the Koran down right. there? Well, well, you see, the, the guy who's burning the Koran came in this during the Summer of Madness he came, event. He did? He did, he did it. But you know, he has a congregation of about 12. Right. And people would yeah, go but to if you, the, what, But if you equate that to how much TV space Right, you exactly. think you have one of these mega churches right. where they summer, fill up the yeah. Astrodome or something. Exactly. Last summer when they had nothing to report but Muslims everywhere, they go to his congregation and they turn him into this superhero. Again, I am not stepping on his right to do anything. As a Muslim... Well, you Quran, think he has a right to burn the Quran? He does. As a Muslim, the Quran is in my heart. The Quran is not ink and paper. He has a right to burn the Quran, but here's the twist. Sarah Palin and all these others who are on the right of the right side, and they come up with this crazy solution. They said, if he doesn't burn the Quran, you don't build a community center. That's why I think he has the right to burn the Quran. I was saying, no, no, the First Amendment gives him the right to burn the Quran, and the First Amendment gives me the right to build this community center. There is no, there's no kind of any kind of concession done on the First Amendment here. So that's what you have to tell people like Pamela Geller and Sarah Palin. You, you do not want to let go of your First Amendment rights in order for people like Donald Trump and Sarah Palin to speak on your behalf. I mean, where is America? I really want to know. Now, Don, before we get to you, I know Spike, you've got to leave in about five minutes. And, and building on what both of you were talking about, which is the responsibility of media, right, and, and putting those views out there. Spike, where has media been responsible? Where are some of the examples that we can hold up? I need some help. <laughs> What?
<laughs> not, not your first or, idea. Or filmmaking. <laughs> it, can, it can be filmmaking. Uh, it could be Hollywood, your examples. It could be with regard to news, as we were just talking about. But wh where are some of, the, where's the, some of that responsibility that you've seen out there, that awareness? It's fleeting. Is it that difficult? Well, we're being overrun by garbage, I would think, on television, and it's selling. And especially in this difficult economic times we live in, you know, they're not just going to cut that loose when it's making money. But I just think that with the people in the power, they really just got to come down and, and understand there is some responsibility because when you get your license from the FCC, right. there was responsibility there. But I, but I think that for many people, is is profits over people. I think to his best example, I mean the best example was the BP, the whole BP thing here, where people of Gulf of the Gulf states were sacrificed for profits and uh, that's really been uh, that's really what this country is built upon though if you look at the what happened to the Native Americans and uh, the stealing of people from Africa the, the, the that's what the country is really built on you know exploitation and now it's, it's slicker now it's glossier sometimes it's harder to to find but you know, people pray, I say this all the time, people pray it and kneel down the altar, the almighty dollar, and if it comes down to it, they'll put their mother on the corner for money. What's your perspective in terms of large media? We've been kind of talking about that. The existence of these media companies, does it squeeze out diverse voices? That's an argument that's being made out there. Well, I don't think it's just a matter of huge media companies. I mean, it looks like a couple of years, three companies own everything in the world. It's not just media. I mean, with all the, I mean, everything is just people buying this and buying that, and there's, you know, fewer places to go to. Just they got they got it on lock. It was on lockdown before, especially with film. There used to be a lot of independent houses, mid-major stuff where you can go, you know, try to get a film made. Those those companies are out of business. They're gone. Gone. What's there in place now? Nothing. The majors. And and and, and like my How man said, like I mean, my man can't... said, now They want a tent pole movie, so they, if, if it can't be done in 3D, come on, with people of color. Now they will make a, a they will make a, a Black Swan, The Fighter, A True Grit. Those films like they're like twenty, thirty-five million dollars, but for African Americans, it's, it's hard to do, especially if Denzel's not in it. Or you. Oh, or me. No, no, don't put me in that. Uh, no, it's, 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 and here's the thing, it's not just African Americans. I just think that it's very, unless you're Spielberg, James Cameron, Tyler, it's hard to get a film made nowadays because the medium range budget film, they're not making anymore. So they'll give you, they'll give you pennies or they'll give you $20 million. Last words, I know you have to hit the road to go to that. <laughs> <laughs> the moon with the hat. <laughs> I just think that we have to keep fighting. And we have to think about our past. Think what Oscar Michelle went through. Sammy Davis Jr., Nat King Cole, when he had a show on, uh, you know, his first show there. Many, many, what Jim Brown did, Melba Van Peoples. Gordon Parks, my man, Ozzie Davis, Ruby D. Great, great battles 
have been won and sometimes looks like we're moving moving backwards. So we just gotta, you know, keep going forward. But it's it's tough now. It's tough. Spike Lee, thank you for being here today. I know you got to go, so thank you. I right, thank you. You got that. I like it. Donna, let's continue with you then. Uh, what are some of the examples you said you're on the business side that mm -hmm. you've looked at that you would hold up as ones that have been responsible? media companies or filmmakers or, or, or writers, columnists. What have you seen out there? Um, I think there are a number of examples of, of folks that have been responsible. I was just thinking when Spike was telling the story, I was thinking of one of my favorite stories from last year actually was the turnaround on the Shirley Sherrod story. Like what, the, how everyone came out and sh they were attacking her from the get-go and at the moment when they found out that the information was incorrect. Mm -hmm. I actually enjoyed sort of watching sort of the unfolding and, and the news stations and the online publications and the print co you know, communications all coming back and actually um, apologizing for what they did. Um, so I think, and I think after that point, they were responsible. Granted, they were very quick to, um, to accuse, um, but they were able to come back, and I think that they gave her the airtime. They did try to make amends for what they did incorrectly. So um, I think that that is one sort of scenario of something that actually wound up starting off bad, but wound up turning out for, for good, at least on, uh, in terms of um, uh, that particular story. Um, I think on the business end, um, as we look at this, at this space, um, it's kind of hard to see that, right? I, as I was mentioning before, um, the dollars are tracking quite frequently with the sort of base level type of content. And um, the viewership, people are watching. Simplistic, you're saying. Very, yeah. sim si very simplistic. Um, I think Spike was talking about reality TV a few moments ago. Um, it's unfortunate, but it is very inexpensive to produce, and people watch it, and they get sucked in. And the people that are producing it and, and selecting the people that are, who are going to be featured on these shows are actually looking for points of tension. Quite frequently, they are points of racial tension. So they'll, they'll cast the woman, the stereotypical black woman who is loud and boisterous and has all kinds of craziness going on with her life. They'll cast her against someone else, and they want to see some type of tension um, occur on television. And when that attention occurs, their ratings go up. And it's because we're, tu we're turning it, tuning in. And our country, we continue to tune into this stuff. And I have these conversations with friends who will sit there and talk about what just happened on, I won't name all the television shows, but they'll start talking about what happened last night on all the shows. And then the next sentence, we'll get into conversations about how awful media is today. And the fact of the matter is, is that you have to begin to vote with your, you know, with, with your TV or with your newspaper choices or with your online choices. You have to determine what is, you know, what is sort of uh, media that's fairly representing uh, what's going on in our country and, and support those um, outlets and turn off the other ones. Because until we do that, um, we're not going to see much of a change. I mean, it's a business, in, in many of these cases, it's a business decision. It's what drives ratings and what drives the advertising dollars. Will uh, runs house, reality TV show there, right? You're right. Uh, did quite well. Yeah. What is positive done about better, that? But yeah, what, did, what's positive yeah. about that? Uh, well, I just think it was, it was just kind of in tune with the times. Here's a, here's a you know, somewhat affluent family who are trying to raise their kids in a family structure and the kids had aspirations and they were fun so it was entertainment but it was a slice of life that you know people could identify with but it was positive uh, and it was real I mean that, that really that really is their life so I think that was positive you know but I'm not I'm not necessarily a guy to say hey you need 10 runs houses you need 10 Cosby shows what I'm saying is you need 10 shows right right now you have two shows if you had 10, then you would have the diversity that people are looking for. It would be an open door and people could be creative and then they could tell different stories because ultimately asking the consumers to, to vote with their feet is hard because consumers won't. They go to work at, they go to work all day or they go to school, they come home, they watch whatever's on. 
And uh, they're not going to vote with their feet. They just, they, just, they just won't. I mean, you know, ultimately, I think it's kind of the obligation of the media companies to say, hey, our goal is to try to be diverse. You know, you want examples of responsible. Now, granted, most of these are historical. Um, when the civil rights movement was happening, you know, the networks realized they didn't have any black reporters. So they hired some, Neil Lomax, Ed, you know, Ed Bradley, um, were some of those early guys who then, that's, that's how they, you know, essentially got discovered. I remember the situation with Max Robinson and when the Muslims had the B'nai B'rith on the hostage, the only person they would talk to was Max Robinson. Um, and then a couple of years later, you know, he was, he was on the anchor desk. I remember seeing uh, uh, Bernard Shaw over in Iraq, uh, bombs in the background. Uh, and then he came back, and, and CNN really has not recovered from his departure because they don't have an evening news program uh, when he was there. And I don't think they realized what they had while he was there. Uh, so I think they have to look at, look in, in 60 minutes. I mean, they're trying out some guys, you know, I mean, they, it, it just became obvious they weren't grooming another Ed Bradley. Or, or mentoring, you know, somebody, you know, I think in newsrooms or even in the media companies, it has become an anthem to talk about diversity because, you know, people are against goals and targets, et cetera. No, you, you, if you don't plan for it, it ain't going to happen. And that's what needs to happen within the newsrooms, and that's what happens, what happens within the entertainment companies. Hey, I want to have 10 black films. Start with that. We're going to fund it to this tune. Uh, and then you can open the door and, and start taking pictures, and they can't all be the same. I don't want all comedies, or I don't want all my reality shows to be, you know, TNA in conflict. You know, I, I need to see different slices of life, and you say that's what we're buying, and then that's what the creative community essentially will be selling. And I have to, I have to agree, just in part, in part with what, I agree with what you're saying, Will, but I also believe that, um, that consumers and watchers, viewers, do have a say. Yes. And I, you know, we just recently, we ran a piece uh, last week um, on race baiting versus racism. I don't know if you read, the, it was a piece that we ran on the, ran on the route. It was talking about Andrew Breitbart, the same Shirley Sherrod guy. Yeah. But basically, the color of change.org decided that they were going to start a petition to get rid of Andrew Breitbart on the Huffington Post. And they had, I think it was 43,000 people that signed the petition. It, did, it raised the eyebrows of the folks at the, at the Huffington Post. And they responded by saying, they actually did take a minute and started looking at Andrew Breitbart. And they responded by saying, he does not have racism in his heart. We know his heart. He's just race baiting. So however you want to slice the words and whatever you want to do with that. The fact of the matter is, is that... Um, they have been looking at sort of where to put him on the site, and they have been responding in part to what Color of Change did. And I, I think that there is something to be said about um, viewers and consumers taking an active role in, in change. And they can make a difference in doing these, you know, whether it's petitions or turning off the team, those types of things. I agree it's not going to happen as quickly as if you were to fund it from the top. Right. But I do believe that there is a role to be played there. Can I say something about Muslims in the media? I think we're starting off at, if anything, minus 10. We're not even at this kind of zero level where we can think, you know, what's positive and what's ahead. And so on a good day in the so-called established media, like the New York Times, on a good day, they would have a story that they in the way that they did about six or seven months ago on um, working or professional Muslim women in the U.S. and every single one of them wears a headscarf because that's what a Muslim woman is to the New York Times. And then, you know, Muslim women like me have to sit there and go, OK, at least they featured positive role models of Muslim women, but none of them look like myself and, and they do not represent the diversity of the Muslim women's experience in the U.S., but at least they're there. So that's what I'm talking about, about, you know, starting at a disadvantage or about a month ago where they had this huge spread in the magazine about a Salafi Muslim preacher in the U.S., again, who represents this tiny slice of the Muslim experience in the U.S., trying to explain where his ultra-conservative views come from. And so, again, you're thinking, well, at least as a Muslim in a magazine, you know, this idea of at least, you know, we've got to get rid of this at least right. because we want to get, you know, many, many views out there. So I'm not sitting there thinking at least... You know, I or someone who believes in what I believe, even though I, I have very little in common with this Salafi guy that they, that they had. 
And I think a lot of the pushback is coming not so much from the established media itself because they still don't recognize our diversity. Where the pushback is coming from is social media because social media is where a lot of the alternative voices who don't have room in the established media is coming from. So you have sites like Muslima Media Watch, which was set up by a group of Muslim women. Um, here in North America, basically, and, and they have writers from across the world who monitor the way Muslim women are portrayed in so-called established media or in mainstream media. And you have just bloggers or kind of, you know, independent writers who, because they don't have a place in the so-called established media, they have to go and create it online. And I'm, I'm fine with that because I think in a few years that will be the place to go because when I look at Egypt, I think one of the main drivers of the revolution, one of the main drivers of what's been happening in the region is these young people who have gone and created spaces for themselves where none existed before. And they, and they use those platforms to take on these regimes. So if that's what it takes here, and if I have to look at established media as the regimes in this country, then so be it. Because it's not, it's not happening. They're not creating that space. They might take a token Muslim reporter or two, but they still want that same story that at the end of the day makes me think at least I'm there, but I've got you know, another five or ten years before they recognize that I too am a Muslim in this country. Well, uh, we have these uh, large buckets. Uh, you did a great job, Mona, of describing to us the Muslim American community and the fact that they're quite diverse in terms of their experiences, where they come from culturally as well as ethnically and nationality as well. That also exists in the Asian American community, uh, as we all know. So with all this diversity, within this diversity, well, to you, the question is, should they be presenting all of these faces? Is it physically possible? C c can you do that for these media companies? Yes. They're representatives of people who live on Earth. You know, it's not like uh, it's not like somebody is saying put people on TV that don't reflect the human beings or the American population. I think what the, the central, and this is why I say it goes back to, you know, what are we, what are our values as a country? And, and whenever we get into those perilous times where we have to go back to the root of who we are as a country, you know, I count civil rights, you know, as, as being, you know, probably the last era where we really had to face it. Then we start making decisions that are based on that, like, yes, there should be, African Americans should have equal access to schools. Uh, different minorities should have equal access to the hospitals. You know, when we go back to the root of who we are as a country, and once we establish ourselves, we are a representative democracy. And that should be reflected in all of the major sectors of, of our country. And, and media should be no different from that. And so if I run you know, a major media company. I do think there's a difference between news and entertainment. I won't go all into it here because entertainment is a very finite resource. There will be a hundred some odd major company films per year. It's a, it's hitting the lotto to get a film made. Any, so that that is a different discussion, but an important one. Television and news is is different. It's not as finite. News, I think, should reflect. Uh, the culture, and I think MSNBC so far, you know, has done the best job of reflecting the wave from what happened during the Obama administration. Before Obama, look, MSNBC on a on a demographic point of view was no different from was really behind CNN to tell you the truth. You know, and it was after the Obama campaign started kicking up, and he became very serious. Then people who had so then they started pulling people in from Chicago now are moving to New York. You know, people who then have access into the world and the Obama phenomenon, then, be, be, then they started being put on the air. Uh, and I think that it's good. It's good for it, to, it's for it to happen that way. But I think that somebody can be more intentional. And if you were more intentional, you'd be a big winner. Like, I'll give you just quickly the converse. Um, I used to work at News Corporation, and um, it was in the in the very beginning years of Fox News. Now, still a nice guy, huh? Still a nice guy. Though. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. I got Goldman in there. Some other stuff that I'm still trying to live down. <laughs> McKinsey. But, yeah, there you go. But <laughs> the Fox, uh, but Fox News was in the early stages, and at the beginning. So Roger Ailes came over and, from CNBC. He had he still had his ideology and his political views, but he was trying to program it still as a broad base network. Uh, ultimately, what they decided was, you know, forget the broad base. Let's just go back to what, what we do, what we do best, you know, and what had, what was being done in, in, in the UK, primarily what had been done in Australia. And then we're going to become the conservative outlet. 
and we're going to have diversity of point of views within conservatism. Uh, and they went, obviously, from being last place, no distribution in New York and L.A., to, you know, becoming the monster that they are today. And I think MSNBC has tried it, but not, they ha it, it hasn't been full-throated. Same thing, you know, with CNN. You know, you can't straddle the line, I think, between object, full objectivity and some point of view. I think you have to, your, your values should not be a point of view. Your values should be your values, period. You plant those, and then you build your company around those values. And I think within, the first media company that says, hey, we are a media company within a representative democracy, the first one who embraces that, like fully, that fully embraces that, I think will, will blow the rest out of the water. Because they will have faces, they will have different. Po they will have the points of view that represent the the country as a whole. Donna, to you, um, as we see the specialized media, specialized news channels, uh, and I mean channel not only in broadcast but also in print and online, uh, as they distinguish themselves based on ethnic groups, uh, does that help or hurt? the issue that we're talking about today, which is race and media? Um, for the moment, I think it still helps, namely because there, there are no, there's no representation in sort of the mass media. Okay. So these, these, these outlets provide an opportunity for people to congregate, to discuss and engage um, around issues that are, um, that are very relevant um, in their communities. And I think that, um, I think to Will's point, as soon as someone understands that you can actually integrate all of these stories and these people into the fabric of what you're doing and actually gain a l broader audience and be respected for doing it and get the business, I mean, all of those things kind of will work. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that someone will win. But until then, it still makes sense for us to right. have these places that are, that are basically surfacing stories that are not being seen other places. And then they'll integrate later on, you're saying? There's a time where you, you'll, you're saying that these sorts of ethnic-based media organizations may not be seen that way anymore, or they'll be integrated in or they'll buy other companies. I think, I think two things. I think there will always be a need for people to find other people of like mind mm -hmm. and to congregate and, 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 and discuss issues. I think that will always be the case, whether it's drawn on, on racial lines, religious lines, or whatever, economic lines. I think those, that will always be the case. But I do believe that as time progresses that you will see more of a um, more integration. You'll have to see it, right? Spike spoke a few moments ago about the browning of America. If you're going to win in this space, you have to begin to look at how do we incorporate all of these voices. You must in order to, to, e to even play long term in this business. So um, I do believe that over time you will see much more integration. But I think it's going to take, I mean, it's, it's, it's the first mover. Who's going to be the first company? Again, I think NBC actually has done a very good job in terms of, in terms of embracing uh, minority managers and, um, and employees and raising them um, throughout the company. But I think we need more. And if you look at the other companies, there are, there are very few companies that are, that are really looking at this seriously and trying to figure out how are they going to win long term. Can I say well, something, Richard? I have a question for you, though. Oh, okay. Do you want to say something first? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll say it after you ask me the question, because I was going to tie in something to what Donna said. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I, two things come to mind quickly. One is the role of Arab-American comedians in the U.S. right now. I mean, there's a growing movement of Arab-American American comedians who started at around 2003, and they perform a function very similar to Lenny Bruce as a Jewish comedian, and Richard Pryor, and Eddie Murphy, and Chris Rock, you know, as black comedians who were facing head-on, you know, discrimination through comedy. And um, Arab-American comedians sold out a theater in, um, on Broadway about four or five months ago, and it was the first time they, they managed to sell out a Broadway theater, and it was a, it was a great moment. And soon after that moment, I began to hear questions, well, should they identify anymore as Arab-American comedians, or should they just be comedians? Because they were, com you know, should they be pigeonholed, at, pigeonholed as Arab-American comedians? And that's constantly the dilemma of anybody who functions as a minority in this country. And I think for a certain amount of time, you do need to identify and work within these so-called pigeonholes because you want to present these diverse faces of it. But sooner or later, you want to be accepted just as an American comedian. And for the Arab American community and the Muslim American community, we're not there yet. Uh, I mean, on that point, uh, th that was a question I was going to ask you, which is when we see faces on television, 
uh, often you'll see those of certain ethnic backgrounds that they would be talking about those specific issues re related to their ethnic background. Yes. And I think it was brought up earlier by the panel. Uh, is there a point, you think, uh, where we can get those faces on air that aren't talking about Muslim American issues? So you'll come on and you'll talk about business, for instance. Yeah. And how do we get there? We get there by inviting more and more people on. I mean, it's just shaking up the Rolodex, basically, because, you know, for anyone who's worked in the news industry, you know how little time you have, and that little time combined with laziness. You just go to the people you know. So it's the same old faces over and over again, you know, the usual suspects. So until we break out of the Rolodex and we start asking friends of friends of friends, 10 friends removed, you know, who do you know and who do you recommend? Because, you know, unfortunately, to break into something like the opinion industry, which is what I've been trying to do for the past 10 years, is incredibly difficult because when you don't have any connections, how are you going to get onto the opinion pages? And then they continuously say, well, women don't want to write opinion pieces, but many women do, but no one goes to women when they want, oh, you know, an opinion piece written by women, and then they complain that women don't, you know, it's a catch-22, they get you either way. So you have to start just, you know, resist going to the usual names and just start fresh, start with people you've never heard before, and give them a chance. If they don't have anything to say, then don't invite them back, you know. I'm not saying bring someone else who isn't an expert. I'm not saying an unfair advantage. But bring on new faces and have, have them talk about everything. Because what really upsets me, especially when it comes to, you know, Muslims being brought, brought on TV, every year I can guarantee, you know, I can set my watch to this. Just before Ramadan, you'll have a piece about what it's like to be Muslim and what it's like to fast. And that person is never again asked to write about anything except about what it's like to be a Muslim and what it's like to fast. Do they not have an opinion on the election? Do they not have an opinion on reality television? Is, is that it? I, I spend my entire life just thinking about fasting. You know, it's not that simple. So I think you just, you need to, uh, to get more people in, give them a chance, and, and I'm sure they can start speaking. So just open it up to more people. And, you know, you see it happening with other religious groups. There are, there are shows that focus on religion. Well, when it comes to Catholic issues, for example, they'll talk to someone who used to be a Catholic. They'll talk to someone who has a complicated relationship with Catholicism. They'll talk to someone who's an Orthodox Catholic. But when it comes to Muslims, it's like this, you know? And, and it's not that simple. We are very diverse, you know? Muslims, just like everybody else, come in all shapes and sizes and colors. So I think, and not just about Muslim issues, but about a whole bunch of... Please ask me to tell you my opinion about Planned Neighborhood. Anyone here who's a producer? Just Do that next time. <laughs> <laughs> Mona, thanks for that. Uh, you know, Will, uh, on that, is it a supply or demand problem? You, you wrote uh, you, you were having difficulty developing serious reporters in unserious times. Uh, are we, is it a supply problem or is it a demand problem? It's something I asked myself when I entered the industry as well. I think everybody's reacting to the success of Fox News. So... And what Fox did was it sold the news. And so now every network is selling the news instead of reporting. But I mean supply in terms of these diverse faces, the supply uh, versus demand. Well, I'm about to get oh, to I'm that. I'm sorry, man. So the reason, this is why I was saying it was, it was unserious, uh, the unserious time. So now everybody's trying to, CNN trying to sell the news. Uh, MSNBC selling the news, ABC. Mm -hmm. every, everybody is basically trying to sell the news. Right. So as soon as you're trying to sell the news to viewers, uh, you it, it, what, what is it, when you get into a sales mentality, what are you doing? Hey, I don't want them to report something that I don't report. I don't want something on their store shelves that aren't that's not on my store shelves. So then you just start reacting to everything out there. Then you start getting stories from Twitter. Then you start quoting Facebook. Then you start saying, see me on, you know, see me in a chat room. You know, you just start just getting caught up, you know, on, on the play by play and selling news when that happens. Anybody can be an expert on a subject because you're not talking about anything that the other guys are not talking about. You don't need experts to basically re report what's being sold as news right now. Uh, so as a result, it gets back to, you know, what you said, which is, hey, who's closest to me? Who can get down to my studio in the next hour to talk about the story that just broke on Twitter? Right. That is essentially that's daytime news right now. You know, a big chunk of it. You know, about what just broke out on Twitter, who can get down to the studio in the next hour and a half or, you know, in, in two hours. So there is no there aren't a set of values of people at, at the media company, or at least it's not apparent. I think it'll change. Like, I really do think when when 2012 comes around, I think we will see, you know, kind of the Spike's point when the campaign kicks off. 
and, and the coverage happens and the Tea Party, you know, dissipates back to the niche that it is. Essentially, it's a, it becomes an interest group, essentially, again, uh, to be reported on. And then when people start seeing the house parties, the rallies, then they're going to be like, hey, I need people who look like those people to go out and talk to them and report on this campaign again. And I think you're going to see another another influx of, of different kind of faces that are going to be on C- CNN and MSNBC, you know, for sure. But it would be much better if at the at the top management level within the the media company so not just the network but the owners of the network said listen all around our company we have a mission to diversify from our suppliers to uh, the subscribers that we go after to, in our customer service and it will also be true in our entertainment products and who reports the news it's not what you report it's it's the who and we're going to become a more representative company. And I think once once one company makes that statement and they begin to see the benefits of doing that, then I think that will have an impact on the rest of the industry. I'm going to turn the boat a little bit here, Don, and I'll move into talking about hip-hop. And Will, we'll definitely get your, your view as well on this and yours too, Mona as a multiracial movement and what it has meant uh, to the discussion that we're having today, which is race and media. You should start with Will on that one. <laughs> um, we can start with yeah. Will and we'll circle back if you like. A bit short. <laughs> I mean, you should hear what you have to say about hip hop. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I mean, hip hop and the, the role of Muslim and Arab American as well as international uh, hip, hip hop stars or, or rap generally is amazing because just following the Middle East and North African revolutions, I can tell you of rappers in Libya, in Tunisia, in Egypt, in so many countries that have taken exactly the values of hip-hop as it started in the U.S. in late 70s, early 80s, yeah. have taken um, the, that art form as the main expression against oppression, against injustice, against uh, underrepresentation, and using it in the most passionate way that many of us who love the, the beginnings of hip hop, continue to love it in those forms today. So it's been amazing. They've taken it exactly. And, and when you hear these songs... How? How, how? Yeah. How? Well, they've taken them. I and mean, the rap is... Let's take Tunisia, for example. There's a great rapper in Tunisia called El General, which means the general. And he raps in Arabic. Now, Tunisia is known for... Mo- a lot of people speak French. But the French in Tunisia now represents a very kind of upper-middle-class existence. So, and, and, you know, those who have followed the revolution, it started by that young man who, who set himself on fire in Sidi Bouzid, a working-class town in the middle of Tunisia that has nothing to do with French and has nothing to do with upper-middle-class existence, but has a very much to do with the underrepresented working class in that country that nobody saw. So this idea of using hip-hop and using rap to point a lens at the invisible was exactly what El General was doing. And because of that, two or three, day, two or three days into the revolution, he was arrested by the Ben Ali regime. And when, after he was released, and, and he was arrested mostly for rap that was basically saying, you know, Ben Ali, you will meet the day where your people will overthrow you. And, and they, they really did. They did. And soon after he was released and Ben Ali was overthrown, his next rap was, come on other Arab countries, we need the revolution. So he was basically passing on the baton to Egypt, to Libya, to Algeria, as we've seen it all spread. And now there's a mixtape. I mean, even the idea of mixtapes, there's a mixtape of rap, revolutionary rap in the Middle East and North Africa that is incredibly exciting. Mm. So not only is it representing those values, but it's been now being sung in a language that the average working class, underrepresented person can understand, and not the language of the privileged and the affluent. And that is exactly mm. the kind of values that surely hip-hop started with. Yeah, I mean... It, it, <laughs> <laughs> look, yeah, that's, look like... I'm just saying that's global. You're it, 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 well, here, here's the big... Well, we don't have a, we don't have a straight up and down, you know, hip-hop critic on the panel, so, it's, you know, so I'm not just going to be as animated as I normally would, but I think the biggest thing about hip-hop is it, it is the lingua franca of youth culture, and so it made people who don't live in the same area who don't have the same life experiences but who have the same emotions and who are looking at the same world have a common language by which they could talk to each other. And that has just been a movement going on since since the the 80s until now. Like it has literally brought like when you show these these census these multiracial statistics mm-hmm. hip hop is a big part of the reason why, you know, the races have gotten together to the point of uh, essentially, you know, creating more kids together. So, it has been uh, it just has been amazing 
but in the same way that you know, why has it been so amazing? What, what, what is this sort of because it, here's yeah. here, this was the biggest problem, at least in the in, you know in the in the six fifties, sixties, and seventies. Anything before seventies, yeah. people did not know each other. They did not live together. They didn't talk to each other. White parents didn't want black kids to be, they didn't want their kids to go to school together. Like, they didn't know each other. In the Deep South, they, you know, blacks and whites knew each other, but only in a subservient relationship. So they didn't know each other as equals and together. So in the 80s, uh, when it became, it, count, it, it could have happened some with rock. Like if if the if the rock movement happened in the 80s, then we'd be like, the rock was this amazing revolution for the races. But it didn't because the races were still separate when the rock revolution happened, when Woodstock happened. You know, they were just starting to come together. But when hip hop happened, they were coming together. So it it gave people a way to talk to each other. That's the reason why when Obama's up and. You know, at the time when when Hillary Clinton was criticizing him, you know, and he could just brush that dirt off his shoulder, auditorium full of white people went crazy, and blacks because they knew, you know, what that meant. You know, so he had a lot of code, and they're like, "This is our president too." Like, you know, with, so you you could just feel that that swagger and in black, white, and everybody felt it. Now here's the limit to hip hop. It is it is a social value system of the way you know people hang out we get along etc it is not a moral value system like it cannot replace um you know it cannot replace what religion the role religion plays as far as morals about who we are it can get us together but it can't it's not the golden rule it doesn't tell me how i treat you you know and so for people who think that, you know, because it brought people together that now it's a it's a new moral code. It's not. It's 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 a it's a social it's an it's art with social engineering benefits. It does not have the moral benefits. That still has to come from the church. That still has to come from uh, what you believe about the country, you know, your 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 political values. All those things still have to be put into, you know, the individual person. It can't solve that problem, but it has done a lot to bring bring people together, and, it, and it's it's all over the world. Wouldn't you say it's evolved though significantly from the the messages from the '80s and '90s to what you're hearing now? It's just at at bottom, the rap has gotten better. <laughs> It's just because it's more people who are doing it. Now, people would say in the fun, in the beginning it was just fun and, you know, party. That's not true. In the beginning it was gangs. You know, Cool Herc was over one gang with DJs in the Bronx, and you go to a party and it's subject to just go off, turn into mass fights. I mean, if you go back to news clips in the 1980s, you couldn't, you couldn't go to a show in the Latin Quarter without... Brooklyn being in the house, right? So when they say Brooklyn's in the house, then Brooklyn comes in and they just tore up the Latin Quarter. If Spike was here, I'm sure he he was he was doing his part in it. But it, it a big uh, for Brooklyn. Now he's gone. You can say that. Yeah, right? but yeah. For, it's on tape for Brooklyn. You know, but a big big part of it. You know, it it, it was still a lot of angst in in problems. It just was not as pervasive. Uh, as it is now. So then whatever the negative effects are that people feel now, because it's all over, they're going to feel it all over. All right. Great way to now move into questions and comments uh, for our panel. And anybody who has a question or comment, please. Hi. <clears throat> My name is Rafael Fantausi. I'm the president and CEO of the National Puerto Rican Coalition. I also sit on the board of the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda and on the Diversity Advisory Council for News Corporation. So it's very interesting everything you're talking about. Um, I, have, I have a comment and a question. Uh, my comment is it's very interesting. You know, I've been here all day listening to different panelists and uh, two panels that I think are very crucial to, to the Hispanic community, which is the politics and the media. I haven't seen one Hispanic. And I have not heard about the Hispanic experience. And uh, that's a little disturbing to me. So that, that's my comment. So maybe it's time for us to start um, redefining the word diversity. Um, and maybe that's, that's something to think about. But when it, in the context of media, I have not heard the mention of advertising agencies. Mm -hmm. Advertising agencies, I call the neck of what media is all about because they move that head in the right direction. Can you comment on it? 
who would like to comment? In terms of, I, I just want to be clear on your question. So are you, are you speaking specifically about what they're creating in terms of advertising or? Well, the media controls the dollars from the corporations. I mean, uh, the advertising agencies tell the corporations where to, how to invest the dollars right. on the media outlets. Right. So they definitely have a very important role for us to be able to leverage them so that then, you know, the, the media outlets will create and, uh, and do the demand and supply that it's needed. Right. So I think what you're here, I mean, I think what's happening at the, in the advertising agencies is exactly what we've been talking about in Hollywood, exactly what we've had in, news, in the news media, um, that there's lack of representation. If you look at most of them, the advertising agencies, large agencies, most of them at the highest levels have very little diversity. Many of the agencies have recently started acquiring sort of smaller houses that focus on Hispanic media or his, uh, focus on African American media or Asian media. Um, but for the most part, at the highest levels, there is very little diversity. And I think that certainly has an impact on, um, it certainly has an impact on what's being created, the type of advertising that you're seeing. And it also has a, is an impact on where those advertising dollars are going. Does that well, answer your question? But, um, but what is your definition of diversity? And, I mean, well, isn't there a lot of, uh, um, you know, folks from, from uh, Jewish background in, 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 in the advertising industry and in the media? I mean, that to me is diversity. Right, but diversity. So I diversity, are you talking about color? Uh, diversity, I think it can represent itself in many ways, certain, certainly, right? Whether it's religion, whether it's race, um, whether it's economic status. Um, it all, you know, there's a, there's a broad range, range of ways to look at it. And in the, in the advertising world, there are for very few minorities, and I'm saying minorities, I'm, thinking, I'm speaking specifically about ethnic minorities represented at the highest levels. Okay. Do you have a follow-up question? No, I ju it's just that, you know, it seems that to me when we're having a conversation about the state of the race in America, we keep using this word diversity, and uh, we use diversity to whenever it's convenient to us. And really, it's time for us to redefine that word, because if we are focusing on differences, then we're always going to perpetuate the problem that that difference exists. And all we do is what Spike said at the beginning. We talk about the same thing over and over and over and over. And maybe it's time to redefine that terminology so that then everybody starts working from the same foundation. Right. Well, to your point, usually, you know, and I... I I take your part to heart with what you're saying about a Latin American represent, I mean, uh, Hispanic representation as it relates to media, because in many ways, like when we, when, when African American entrepreneurs look at companies, when, especially when it comes to television, lat Latinos are a, a model minority in the ability to have networks that are across the nation and to go in and get specific budgets from the advertisers. I'll give you an example. I was on the advisory board for uh, Starcom Media Vest, um, and we came up with a concept called the African American Content Alliance. It was like, how are we going to create more runs houses, right? Uh, essentially, you know, was was the question. And it's like, look, uh, bottom line, if you come with, if a sponsor comes in and they commit, a, a, a General Motors or, or Parker and Gamble comes in, and they commit, and, and they say, hey, we're going to back this show, then an MTV or a network will put it on the air. Uh, almost assuredly, um, and so we went. We tried to we tried to put it together. They could not get on their side enough. Johnson and Johnsons, uh, Walgreens, Walmart's enough advertisers within their portfolio of companies. This is a global media company. I mean, ad, ad, media holding company, ad agency. This is not a this is not a boutique agency. This is a, a major agency, and they could not get them to commit to. You know, the several million dollars that it would take to put together a series on that scale. Now, they took the same idea, uh, and you, you probably, you know, work with these guys. Took the same idea and said, okay, well, we're going to try with the Hispanic community, the, with, a, with a Latino content alliance. Do you know that within 120 days, they were able to get nine figures worth of commitments uh, for Latino programming? And there are many reasons for that, but one of them is the Hispanic community is much more organized when it comes to getting corporate dollars. You won't see it in the film industry. You won't see it in some, in some industries, but when it comes to, to television, print, 
je and you have your own distribution, right? Univision and then to second player, you know, Telemundo. Um, and it, it was just- But Univision is not Hispanic owned. I right, just want to make that you gotta, very but, but, clear. But, but you have to leave that, it's, I know that's important from a, a wealth building perspective, but if, if I'm a consumer, an end consumer at the end of the day, uh, Tyler Perry does not own the studios, the, the, the theaters that are in the neighborhoods. I, I don't dig deep about, you know, how, what percentage owned is Lionsgate of this. You know, I will support it because, you know, like narcissists, I want to see my image. And so Univision is viable to, for consumers. I'm not saying, I'm not, I understand the, the, the argument that you're making at the end of the day, but I'm saying that we had ideas on shows that were working that could not attract advertising dollars and versus shows that were still in theory that could attract advertising dollars from the Latino market. And the answer to that is not for me to be mad at, at uh, Latinos and for us to get into it over those limited budgets. It's to go back to the core principles, which is to say media companies need to tell advertisers we are going to be representative across our properties, what we produce, who calls the shots at our companies will be representative of the democracy. So when we say diversity, that's what we mean. It will reflect um, the population you know, of the country. Raphael, thank you so much. We've got uh, three more minutes and two great questions coming up, I'm well, sure. I don't know how great it is, but um, my name is Carol Gregory. I'm with um, One Economy, and I, I'm a director of communications, so this uh, topic was especially of interest to me. And you talk a bit about the, the laziness of journalists, but just wanted to point out also how, um, you know, a lot of traditional media was really uh, based on an old business model that started failing and, and, and folks didn't recognize the, the impact that internet would have, uh, social media, the fact that bloggers now have press credentials. Um, and as a result, newsrooms have shrunk terribly. So, you know, and it's, it's just more of a comment on, um, you know, the, the, in addition to laziness, you have uh, newsrooms that were cut in half, print uh, newsrooms that are also cut in half, and, and a lot of the veterans are gone. You have very, very young kids sometimes out there um, telling those stories. I wonder, um, as you're looking, um, we, we, I think I mentioned in kind of a shout out that um, One Economy launched something called the Public Internet Channel, PIC.TV, and we have um, people such as Robert Townsend, who produces a program called Diary of a Single Mom, you know, um, where he can't get that on regular TV, but he's uh, doing it on the internet, and, and not just because it, he can't do it on, on regular TV, but because he also realizes that so many people are getting content through online, so he's actually, it's a strategic move in trying to reach an audience uh, that's growing. Do you think the internet has the capability of being what television might have been 20 years ago? Mm. For, for media and for also for film, for entertainment distribution, and et cetera. For That's an easy voices. question. Who wants to take that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be very quick so that Will and Donna can also jump in too. I, you know, I think the way, as we move forward, as traditional media like the New York Times and others start putting up all those paywalls, as budgets become a reality, as you said, I'm glad you mentioned that because budgets are obviously a consideration. I think the kind of media model that we have to start looking at now is not one that is a contentious relationship between traditional mainstream media and online media. I think the two of them have to start dancing together. They have to understand that they need each other. Because of the budget cuts and because mainstream media can't move that fast, they have to start depending on what have been become known as citizen journalists or you know people who are on Twitter more or Facebook more or who do have that flip cam and can go out there and, and operate very quickly. At the same time, those citizen journalists could also uh, use the, 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 the huge platform that various mainstream media sites can offer them. So I think this is the model that we have to look at now. I don't think one or the other is going to replace the other. It doesn't have to be this kind of very, very paranoid, contentious relationship. I think it should be symbiotic. I think they, they could look at ways where they can strengthen each other because that will be the future because I spend my entire day on Twitter. So, you know, if someone can get me on Twitter, I will be there. And, and people are beginning to straddle the two. So I think this is the, the model for the future where they learn to dance together rather than combat each other. 30 seconds from either one of you two. I would, I mean, I agree wholeheartedly with what Mona just said. I basically, I mean, basically, actually, if you look at the, the recent statistics on online dollars, advertising dollars, um, they are actually going more and more toward, um, uh, from, from print 
uh, to uh, online journalism. You also, if you would look at the online readership of news versus the print readership of news, 46% uh, of Americans actually get their news now from uh, the news, sorry, online places versus the, uh, the print. Uh, newspapers. So you're starting to see this movement toward online media. I'm not saying I think Mona's right. You have to figure out how we're going to work this together. I think the models are going to be completely different. I think you're going to start seeing different ways to pay for media, um, whether it be micro payments. Um, you might see some of the subscription models. I actually am I'm actually excited to see what's going to happen with the New York Times and their recent pay model. I mean, there are going to be a number of different models that emerge over the next couple of years till someone gets it right. Well. Anything? No? Yes. More every day. <laughs> okay. All right. Very good. All right. Last question, please. Hi. I'm Keith Lawrence. I'm with the Roundtable and Community Change of the Aspen Institute. And thanks for a great, for a great discussion. I just wanted to ask you to say a little bit more about the, the very, very difficult responsibility question or challenge, um, the shared responsibility challenge. To the extent that, that the problem we, we face is a problem of structural racism a structural problem. This, this, this matter of media representations is, is, is a critical part of the problem. And, and dismantling these, these representations, changing these representations, I think is, is, a, is, a, is a critical priority. Um, but could you say a little bit more about, about how the responsibility for addressing these images and stereotypes and representations that we see so often in, in, across the media ought to be shared. You, you, you talked a little bit about the importance of those who, who lead these organizations, recognizing the importance of, 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 of greater diversity. But can you say a little bit more about what you think the responsibility of, of com the, 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 the consumers are, the, the, the communities who consume these images might be? And you know, also the folks who participate in these, these programs who, you know, accept roles in, in movies that are not necessarily positive. Can you say a little bit about how you think the balance ought to be struck with respect to these responsibilities? Good comment there, Keith. Uh, also, final words, if you could, uh, to the panel. Uh, and again, about 30 seconds. I apologize, Keith, as, as we wind it up here. Who would like to start first? Go ahead, Donna. Um, in terms of, well, in terms of, uh, Keith, what you were asking, um, I think that over the next number of years, we're going to continue to see um, growing diversity in the major media. As I mentioned before, we, there, must, there has to be a change at the top levels. There has to be a change at the sort of bottom levels of what's going on in order for companies to succeed long term. Um, I will tell a very, very brief story, but a, a, a colleague of mine came in the office the other day and he said, you know, it's interesting to me. He said, my child just had uh, some two girls over the other day and I asked him who, who they were inviting over for, um, for a sleepover. And he said the girl, the, his daughter explained that the, girl was, the girls were really smart and they were really funny and they were lots of fun. And when the two girls got to the house, both children were black and his daughter was white. And he was absolutely baffled that this chi his child did not mention that these two little girls were black. And I think we are going to, as we look at this nation and we look at where we're going as a nation and how it is evolving and changing, that people are going to be, we, we have to begin incorporating and integrating people from all different religious, ec economic, and um, ethnic backgrounds in order to be representative. Um, because we have a whole generation that's coming up that does not see the world and the way that we have seen the world and the way that our parents have seen the world. And in order to win in this space, you're going to have to be inclusive. Um, speaking of, of specifically about the, uh, the American Muslim community, 9-11 you know, was a shock to everybody, Muslims included. I mean, Muslims died in, in the attack. And I think one thing that it, it, it made us realize, whether we have been in this country for centuries, as I said, or whether we are newcomers to this country in the way that I am, is our responsibility in speaking out. And one thing that I learned last year during the whole Park 51 debacle was that according to polls, only 38% of Americans say they know a Muslim. But that says two things to me. A, that Muslims are still quite a small minority in this country, but B, most Americans probably don't think I'm a Muslim. 
so they would not tell the pollster that they know me as a Muslim. So my responsibility now becomes, it's almost like being gay, where you try in the first three sentences to put into the conversation that you are a Muslim. And so that's my challenge now. <coughs> well, I will meet complete strangers, you know, with a, whether it's in a hotel, you know, breakfast buffet, or in a supermarket, and we're having a conversation. And within three sentences, it's my challenge to let them know I'm a Muslim. Because I want them to go home and think, wow, I met a woman who turned out to be Muslim, and I would never have guessed that she's a Muslim. So, I mean, that, that's my kind of my quick way of saying that the American Muslim community recognizes that we have to speak out more, we have to get out there more. So we have now comedians, we have writers, we have actors. You mentioned actors and the roles they're taking, and a lot of those actors are speaking out and saying, no more doing this Allahu Akbar, I'm going to blow you roles. No more, you know, because they do feed these awful, hateful um, images that people are getting. But also the community is learning to write to editors when they see, you know, a hateful story. The community is learning how to campaign. It, it's all this kind of grassroots stuff that the community in all its, di its diversity is learning. The African-American Muslim community knows this very well because they have been facing discrimination as blacks in this country for centuries. We, as the newcomers to this country, we the Muslims of immigrant descent, must learn more from our African-American Muslim brothers and sisters as well as all the others. You know, from the Latino community, from the, from the Asian community, from the Jewish community, all communities, we have so much to learn. But I think one of the, one of the, the, the biggest thing is to just speak out and speak out louder. The individual always has the ultimate responsibility for their choices in their lives, period. That, I just think that's a fact. But when you get into the public square and you're talking about media and government, Etc. then those entities also have a responsibility. Uh, and so that's the reason why I take the points of view that I take, that the media has responsibility. But I'm, I'm super optimistic, because even in my adult lifetime, when Doug Wilder uh, left office in Virginia, and people were like, will there ever be another black governor? Like, people thought that was, it was, it was over, you know? like. It, that this is the end of the, the apex of blacks in government. And literally within 20 years, there's a black president. And he's not even done with this first term. And people are saying, will there ever be another, you know, black president? You know, so I just think I'm pretty optimistic on all these questions. And, you know, in the media in particular, I just want to be a part of it, you know, which is the reason why, you know, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm out and I'm active. And I just believe that my, my, when my kids grow up, They'll, they'll be able to play in pretty much, you know, everything all over the globe. I just think that there's an opportunity now if a media company would seize it. Great note to end on. Will Griffin, thank you so much. Mona Atahawi, thank you so much for being here. Donna Bird as well. Impressive and so open in, in, about all of your views today. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, uh, as well, and uh, for a fantastic panel. If you'll just stay for one second, uh, because uh, it, was, it was great to have it end on a note of optimism as well. Uh, I do want to just sort of summarize uh, a little bit for the day, and also to mention uh, that uh, on the politics panel, unfortunately, Tomas Perez, Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, was, uh, had a medical uh, problem last week and had to withdraw from that panel. So. Uh, we we were sorry, uh, but uh, we he he was not able to come. So uh, starting with uh, Dr. Pinderhuse's uh, presentation, we saw the times are a changing, and I think that was a theme throughout. We saw there's uh, there's definitely changes in the uh, in the population that we're getting to a browning of America, a majority minority. Uh, minority majority, uh, however you want to look at it, uh, and that uh, also that we have to look at America in the world uh, view, that you know, the, the world is flattening, we are competing worldwide, and that has significant change, uh, that those changes have significant uh, impacts on how we think about uh, our population, that there's a greater urgency to compete and therefore utilize uh, our entire talents, our entire population. At the same time, we have to think about American values, and the question is how to raise the standard of living in America uh, to acceptable levels for everybody, and also how to maintain the American dream where anyone can succeed. And what are some of the competing considerations we have as we think about these um, about these issues? And we looked at it first in the uh, family and home, uh, and identity, and 
uh, talked about the personal versus the institutional. And, uh, and the third was the, the cultural. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Sonny uh, Garg you know, talked about that three-leg stool and how that's all changing. We saw how uh, the, the losses of one uh, impacted how uh, the need for making up for that in, in other areas. But um, uh, as we, uh, we ended on that, it really there was a, a call for uh, doing something to improve the lot of uh, the poorest Americans. Um, we went into uh, the politics and, again, saw that the changing demographics uh, showed a need for the political parties and the political process to take in and pay more attention to and address uh, these minority populations, whether it's uh, Democrats or Republicans. Uh, we also saw the difficulties that minorities face in uh, uh, running for office and uh, bringing themselves to uh, uh, bigger and bigger offices or more important offices statewide uh, and national offices. Um, but uh, in the end, we did see that they were going to have to be responsive to these emerging uh, uh, minority populations. Uh, we moved to the institutions. We looked at schools and businesses. And, um, you know, the, I guess the schools is probably the most depressing uh, of all the uh, subject areas. But, you know, the need to improve the schools and the different methods that uh, we're trying to utilize today to uh, improve the schools for, uh, for everybody, but particularly for communities of color where, uh, where people have been underperforming, whether it's students or teachers or uh, are the schools themselves, and what can we do to uh, build up and uh, allow every student to reach uh, his or her potential. And in businesses, uh, the need for businesses to pay, you know, if you're going to be a viable business, this came up again in this, in this panel, if you're going to be a viable business going forward, you're going to need to be taking into account uh, uh, what we're calling minority populations, the new majority populations, but uh, taking into account this, this emerging um, important uh, economic sector. Uh, and now going on to uh, the media, uh, we did talk about the, uh, the negative portrayals, um, how uh, you know, the, the, the standards or lack of standards that we have today uh, that um, uh, but on the other hand, um, the emergence of new media, the pressures the new media are putting on uh, traditional media, uh, and that it's all going to kind of, as somebody said, Dan, they're all going to be dancing together in any event if they aren't already. Uh, but we ended, I think, on a very uh, positive note in that respect. Um, to pull them together, I think uh, when we look at how do we respond to these changes, I think we saw the need for investment, investment from government, investment from business. How do you invest? What will you invest? What are those priorities? We looked at the need for programs, whether they be nonprofit programs, governmental programs, uh, but you know, what are some specific programs that can be used in each of these cases? Um, but, and I've done a lot of conferences, and almost always the most difficult is the culture, is changing the culture, changing how people think about particular issues. And the, I think, personally, the encouraging thing about all that is that the new culture, where the, the white kid invites over the black kid and doesn't even mention the race to the parents, that's happening. And uh, we're seeing you know, greater multiculturalism. Uh, what is it? One in seven marriages now are multicultural. Um, and I think that as we get this emerging uh, population, we are seeing some some difference in, uh, in attitudes and hopefully uh, changes in the culture. They may be slow, they may be too slow for, for a lot of us, but uh, hopefully it's, it's uh, moving forward. Um, at the end of the day, it's, as uh, again, as I think Will said, it's up to every one of us what our standards are, what our, what our values are, and how we individually are going to act in each of these areas. Uh, so let me now... Uh, conclude by thanking again the Comcast Corporation for sponsoring this and giving us uh, not only sponsoring but uh, a, a real partnership in uh, directing and, and uh, helping us uh, pull this off. Joe Waz, 
Brett Perkins, Payne Brown, Paula Madison, Susan Gonzalez, thank, and, of course, David Cohn. Um, I want to thank um, Juan Williams and Richard Louie, uh, and also uh, Diane uh, Penderhues, uh, and all the panelists for spending your time, very valuable time, uh, and expertise in sharing it with all of us. Uh, I want to thank the Aspen team, uh, headed by Kiana Williams, who is our uh, project manager, but all of the Aspen team and on the Communications and Society program and also the Roundtable on Community Change. Uh, and thank you very much for uh, all the work you've done to put into this. And uh, not least, everybody here who has sat through the day uh, here in, at the museum or uh, on the air, uh, thank you for uh, participating, um, for giving us your time and uh, hopefully for taking action from it. So thank you for a great day, and hopefully this is just the beginning of an ongoing dialogue.